True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. My wife has fallen through a rock and on the north south summit of Gear Mountain. She's in really critical condition. I was serving in a patrol function that day, and uh, I overheard a dispatch uh, call that said a, a woman had fallen from a cliff. Her husband was with her, and uh, she was severely injured. My name is Harold Hempthorne. Hempthorne? H-E-M-P-H-O-R-N. And your wife? Her name is Tony, T-O-N-I. Probably about quarter after six, I got the go-ahead to uh, start up the trail, hopefully to perform life-saving EMS care. We think Ranger Faraday is closed. By this time, it was dark. The moon came out, and it lit up the entire ridge, and I was able to get my bearings and kind of vector in on where the fall had happened. Tony was in bad shape. Her eyes were open slightly, and her, her pupils were fixed and dilated. She had an obvious head wound. She had a shirt wrapped around her head, appeared to have blood on it. And when I checked for a carotid pulse, um, I didn't find a, a pulse. I told Harold that, you know, I'm sorry, your wife is gone, she's gone. And Harold, at that point, he seemed very distraught. He repeated what I had said. I think so too, Mark. At the time, I just thought it was what 99% of these are, just a tragic accident. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. It was in 2012. Harold and Tony Henthorn celebrated their 12th wedding anniversary. They took a hiking trip to Colorado's Rocky Mountain National Park. Tony plummeted off a 100-foot cliff, and she died a horrible death. Harold told police that his wife was busy taking photos, and she must have slipped. He didn't see exactly what had happened because he was using his cell phone and he was distracted at the time. This could have been a tragic accident. After all, Harold was a respected member of their community, looked like a loving husband and a devoted father to their daughter. He worked as a fundraiser for churches, charities, and nonprofit groups. At least that's what he told everyone. But maybe things weren't what they appeared to be. Friends and family thought they knew him but facts surfaced that painted a new picture of Harold Henthorne. Harold actually had no job and no income. He also had a shady history, which included a first wife who had died in a freak accident. Harold's history, along with his ever-changing narrative of Tony's death, led to a murder investigation. Life insurance, years of deceit, and inappropriate behavior were gathered to create a strong circumstantial case against him. In today's episode, Over the Edge, we look back at the lives of Sandra Lynn Henthorn and Tony Henthorn, two wives whose final moments were likely filled with fear and violence, murdered by the man who claimed to love them. And we have a Colorado beer. Yeah, it seems like we've been spending a fair amount of time in Colorado lately. It seems like there's been some interesting things happening in Colorado. Yeah. Yeah, not good for wives in a lot of instances. Apparently not. So this is a beer for you. It's a wild ale. Yay. It's called The Cut. It's a sour cherry beer. It's brewed by Casey Brewing and Blending in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. This is kind of a rosé-colored beer. Not your typical gold or amber. Little thin fizzy head, kind of like you'd expect in a wild ale. Sweet and sour cherry aroma. Some oak, because it's aged in oak barrels. And a little of that barnyardy, funky stuff. I love that. And the taste follows the nose pretty exactly. The cherries are there, the oak is there, the funk is there. It's a, an effervescent, bubbly beer. Tickle your nose. Tar it on the palate. Very nice. Highly rated. Okay. What's the alcohol percentage? 5%. Yeah, they tend to be on the low side. Not They'd... that I'm complaining, but I mean, how much beer am I supposed to drink? As much as you want. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Well, How much beer is too much? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, there's no real answer to that. No. Everyone needs to answer that for themselves. That's right. And I say that, 
as someone who would never drive after drinking, of course. Oh, absolutely not. Okay. I just like to make that clear. Let's open it. Okay. So why don't you start out this fascinating story about Harold Henthorne and his two wives? Yeah, this is a very interesting story. We've done some really interesting cases the last few times. Well, we try to. We try and and pick out ones that we find interesting, hoping that our listeners will agree. We do. And it's almost like the truth is stranger than fiction. Absolutely. In a lot of cases. You can't make this stuff up. It would be hard to. Anyway, Tony Bertolet was the middle child in her family, born between her brothers Todd and Barry. She was born in 1962, and she grew up in Mississippi, in a family that had become wealthy in the oil industry. Tony was an easygoing child, and as a teen, rarely became involved in drama. Although she was sort of happy-go-lucky, she was also a strong and independent woman. Growing up with boys, she was tough on the school playground, and she was a gifted athlete. Basketball was her favorite sport. Academics came easy to her. She had a photographic memory. It's always a big help, isn't it? I'm always so jealous of those people, because my memory's just shit. (laughs) Worse as I get older, I have to say. She took Latin in high school, and she knew it so well that by the time she got to college, she didn't even have to attend the class. All three of the Bertolette children knew what they wanted to be when they grew up. Todd became a geologist like his father. Barry and Tony chose medical degrees. So Barry was two years older than Tony, and he specialized in cardiology. Tony chose ophthalmology, an eye doctor. After med school, Tony started her own practice in Mississippi, and she was very close to her mom. Actually, her mother kept and managed her books. Tony really cared about her patients, and she was very well-liked. She was devoted to her career, but it was also important to her to have a work-life balance. Ophthalmology attracted her, her brothers think, because she didn't want to have this demanding schedule and be on call all the time like you can be with other specialties. Well, she she mentioned, or someone mentioned, her brother, who was the cardiologist, was on call, and he was out of the home a lot. Sure. There's a lot of cardiac emergencies that you have to attend to. Absolutely. Not too many ophthalmologic emergencies. No. That's what I always thought. Ophthalmology, dermatology are good choices if you want kind of a nine-to-five job like she did. And that's partly because she wanted to have some free time to start a family, and she wanted to raise children. And even though she was independent and smart, of course she wanted to have a family. She had these two sides of life she wanted to fulfill. She got married to her college boyfriend, who was a dentist named Charles Richardson, and they settled down in Meridian, Mississippi. But unfortunately, the marriage didn't last, and Tony was very disappointed. This divorce really weighed heavily on her. She saw it as a failure in her life. Still, she wanted to have children, so she planned that she would remarry. When she reached her late 30s, she was afraid that time was really running out to start a family of her own. So she turned to an online dating site, and being a Christian, the one she turned to was ChristianMingle.com. And I've always thought when we were researching this that the overriding factor in her wanting to remarry was so she could have a child. That's what her family presented it as. And, of course, you don't have to be married to have a child. Well, if you're a very strict Christian like her, I think that's definitely preferred. I don't think it would have been that great for her to think that she would just get pregnant by buying sperm or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I just think it's kind of sad. Well, it is very that, sad. Uh, God, i got to get married because I want to have a child. Well, I think she didn't only want a child. She wanted a husband. She wanted a family like her parents had. That was her vision. Yeah, okay. I think she was mostly looking to have a baby. Well, I think she was looking to have a baby, but she wanted to raise that baby in a marriage. That's the way she looked at it. She was very traditional that way. So I could see why she'd go to Christian Mingle. Oh, absolutely. No, I, I don't have any problems with Christian mingle. No. If I were a Christian man or a Christian woman, and I'm looking for a mate, I would probably use it. Sure. But I mean, there is some value to having a partner. You might say she just wanted a baby, but I'm sure there would be value if she had a partner who she loved, of course. I think she wanted that too. Okay. 
1999, Tony was looking through her matches on Christian Mingle when she saw a photo of an attractive guy. He described himself as 40-something, about six feet tall, with a toned physique, wavy brown hair, and brown eyes. She saw pictures of him, which looked really good, and he seemed to have the qualities she was looking for in a life partner. He was a Presbyterian who served as a deacon in his church. He liked to go to the movies. He didn't drink much. He didn't smoke. And he lived in a nice house with his dog. So he sounded like he had potential. Also, he listed his career as executive and managerial. I'm an outgoing, fun, caring, sincere, growing man of God. One who is very young at heart, is passionate about life, has a great sense of humor, and who communicates well. He also wrote that friends would probably add that he's very active, adventurous, trustworthy, and sensitive. A guy who has a heart for others, especially children, and is a good listener. He wrote that even though he never had children, he was a dedicated uncle to his 15 nieces and nephews. He also described himself as tall, dark, athletic, and attractive. He added that back when he was 15, he was an Eagle Scout. Now to me, this would throw up some red flags. I think he's, you know, just touting himself a bit much. I know you have to put yourself out there, but... Well, I would only say that if you're in a dating site of whatever it is, you got to present yourself so that you're noticed above the others. Yes, I guess. I don't know about above the others. I mean, you want someone to know who you really are. Bragging about yourself won't get you anywhere because they're going to eventually meet you and see, you know, you're not all you pumped yourself up to be. You're supposed to tell the truth, obviously. Obviously. But you got to do something that sets you apart from all the other entries on that site. Okay. Right? I suppose. Well, how am I going to get hooked up? I mean, I shouldn't say hooked up. (laughs) How am I going to meet the person of my dreams if I just have an ordinary posting there. Well, okay, I see what you're saying. I mean, it doesn't hurt to boost himself up, but I just think it was a bit much when I read it. it oh, seemed... I, don't, I don't disagree that okay. it was a bit much. Okay. No, not, it I was. mean, why do you have to say you're attractive? If she sees pictures of you, she can decide if you're attractive. Right. And I don't know, I guess maybe it's important to him, but uh, 15-year-old Eagle Scout. Well, that might have been a little tongue-in-cheek. I don't know. But anyway, it appealed to her, which is the point of the whole thing. Now, this guy's name was Harold Henthorne. He wrote that he had worked for the past 10 years for a national firm as a development consultant for -for not-for-profit organizations, which included churches, ministries, and hospitals. He was living in Denver, but his job gave him a lot of freedom and flexibility. Now, one of the things later on is that they had to live in Denver because that was his home base. That's what he said, yes. Except he's also saying, I have a lot of freedom and flexibility. Well, this is all very hinky, and we'll get into yeah, that. we yeah. will. Yeah. He was a widower, too, but his profile didn't say anything about his late wife, which, you know, maybe it shouldn't. The only previous relationship that he did mention was with a woman who broke things off. And, of course, he said this was for no reasons involving him. But Tony was definitely intrigued with him. The one thing about her, though, is she kept this a secret. She came from a very close-knit family, but she didn't feel comfortable telling anyone that she was looking for a date on the internet. People feel like this less and less, but this is the 90s, and a lot of people were embarrassed to say they found their boyfriend or girlfriend on the internet. But they did eventually meet and start dating. And she eventually told them how she'd met him. Right. Yeah. Her parents, the Bertolettes, met Harold Henthorne for the first time on New Year's Eve, 1999. He'd come to Mississippi with Tony for the holidays. They'd been dating for several weeks, but they definitely surprised the family when they announced that they were getting married, and they were going to move to Denver, where Harold worked. So there's a couple of bombshells, huh? It's a whirlwind relationship. Yeah. I mean, first they didn't even know she was dating. Then she says, oh, I'm going to bring my, my new boyfriend home for the holidays. And then they announce, oh, yeah, we're going to get married, and uh, we're moving to Denver. <laughs> wow. Because Tony was extremely close to her family and her parents. Oh, yeah, very close-knit family. It seems like they all kind of lived around the same area. Her mom was very involved in her life, especially after her divorce, after her first marriage. But her parents, Yvonne and Robert, were pretty impressed with Harold. He did seem to really be in love with Tony. And why wouldn't he be? I mean, she was cute. She was successful. She really had a lot to offer. 
he told her parents that he was going to buy her a million dollar house and take care of her. So according to Harold, Tony's income was insignificant compared to what he earned. He said he would support her and she would be able to stay home when they had children. Now I have a couple of things to say about that. What do you think about that? Well, I don't think I'd be telling my prospective in-laws that I'm so wealthy that my income is way more than your daughter's income. And the word insignificant. Yeah. Yeah, it's really awful. Now we have to say, though, that Tony was quite wealthy. And not only was she a doctor, successful doctor, but her parents had oil money that she had shares in. Yeah, she got oil dividends, and her parents gifted her many thousands of dollars each year. Yeah, about a quarter of a million. Yeah, she was uh, very well off. Yes. So for him to say that just sounds stupid, even if it was true. He was an outgoing guy. Supposedly, he had this great career, and he said he was very wealthy. So even though the brothers weren't thrilled with him right away, they did seem like a compatible couple. Yeah, I guess the parents were taken in by him pretty easily, at least initially. Yeah. And the brothers were more standoffish. Cardiologist in particular was definitely not sure about old Harold. That Harold seemed like a salesman? Yeah. Yeah. That was trying to sell you something you weren't interested in? Yeah. What did he say? He was a... He was the guy who cold called you uh, and spent a few minutes and then you hang up and you wish you had those few minutes back in your life again. Great comment, yeah. But Harold also talked about his background working briefly as a geologist. That's what he'd gone to school for. He'd studied and knew some about geology and he'd supposedly worked for Chevron. He told the Bertolettes that his career path eventually took him to professional fundraising for nonprofit organizations and churches. So her brother Todd was a geologist, and so was her dad. So that was kind of impressive, I guess. Yeah, well, there's some some good bonding to be had there. Yeah, I mean, how many people are geologists, really? Yeah. Harold told them that he was a widower, but they didn't ask any details about how his wife had died. Which, you know, I can see that. It's a sensitive subject. But Tony and Harold wanted to get married really soon, and they set a date for September, which was nine months away from when they met him. But there were some things about Harold that irritated or, or maybe gave the Bertolette family a little pause? Yeah, he wasn't an easy guy to get along with. No. The first thing was the wedding announcements. Harold wanted his, his name to go first, not Tony's. Now, I don't go to that many weddings, <laughs> but every single wedding invitation I've ever seen in my life, the wife or the bride-to-be is first. Yes, you're right. Harold also didn't want Tony to use her name, Dr. Tony Bertolet. I don't know, maybe it made him feel insecure because she was a respected physician or what, but anyway. Yeah, he didn't want the doctor on there. Yeah. But as, as we said, the bride's name traditionally appears first, and everybody in town knew Tony as Dr. Bertolet. But Harold insisted that they be printed the way he wanted, and they were. And most guys don't care. Even I wouldn't really care. So why would you argue with your bride-to-be's mother about something so stupid anyway? Good question. So that would irritate me. Then there were things with the rehearsal dinner. It was going to be at the clubhouse in Tony's brother Todd's neighborhood, and Harold said if Todd took care of it, he would reimburse him. But he never reimbursed him. Traditionally, the groom or the groom's family pays for the rehearsal dinner, but Todd didn't feel comfortable demanding a check from his new brother-in-law. For somebody who was supposedly very wealthy, it seemed odd that he didn't pay this bill. It's all a little odd, too, that these are people in their 40s. Right. Or she was near 40 and he was in his 40s. So do you really need your parents to pay for any of that? Well, that's a whole other topic. Pay yeah, for. this this is a, a traditional, I guess, Christian family. Yes, but, but well, you think a guy in his 40s would at least pay for the rehearsal dinner. Well, yeah. Yeah, especially when he said he was going to. He said he would. So whenever someone does something like that, it gives me pause to, are they really an honest person? Oh, that would make me really pause. Yeah, and, I think it was think more about, about that than the money. All these people had a good amount of money. Yeah, no, it wasn't the money. Right. Like you said, they had plenty. Yeah. But just, he tells his prospective brother-in-law, I'll pay you back, and he doesn't. And this guy is supposed to be so wealthy that Tony's income is insignificant compared to his. Which would make you think he must have said he was making like a million dollars a year. It's yeah. the only way her money could be insignificant. Right. Crazy. 
Well, another thing that upset Tony's mom was Harold's behavior on the night before the wedding. That night, Harold came by Tony's house as Tony and her mom were working on some last-minute tasks for the ceremony, and Tony was packing for their honeymoon. Yvonne told Harold that Tony didn't want to see him the night before the ceremony. Again, tradition, right? Yeah, they're very you, traditional. You, you don't see the bride the day before the wedding. So, I mean, when you think about all this tradition, do you kind of see now why she would want to have a marriage before a baby? Sure, I'll go with that. Okay. But Harold had brought some of his shirts over to the house, and he wanted Yvonne to iron them for him. Yeah, that just made me laugh. Yeah, that's terrible. And this was 11.30 at night to top it off. So this really upset Tony, who felt that he was being very disrespectful to her mother and her wishes. So Tony actually went into the bathroom and cried about this, and her mom consoled her and told her, hey, it's not too late to back out of this wedding. But Tony said she was sure she wanted to go ahead. Well, at least Mom said, it's not too late. I know, but how hard is it to back out the night before? Huh. I can imagine it'd, that's tough. It'd be impossible. It'd have to be something really serious to make you do that. So September 30th, 2000, Tony and Harold were married in a formal southern wedding in Jackson, Mississippi. The ceremony was at noon at the First Baptist Church, and the reception was held in the afternoon at an antebellum home. Tony's parents paid for it, but Harold still needed to control every detail. He picked out the songs. He picked out the girl that would sing. Then Tony paid for the photographer, but Harold was very particular about what pictures would be taken. Yeah, in general terms, this guy's just kind of a pain in the ass, right? He sure is. I mean, Fun. when I'm reading this stuff, I'm thinking, why did she even marry this jerk? I think she wanted to get married and have a family. Well, she had to have that family, yeah, but and still. And I mean, he did look good on paper. He did, but boy, everything he's been doing makes him look like a jerk. Absolutely, yeah. Another thing he did, he made her brothers ushers instead of groomsmen. And that's a bit of an insult. They should have been groomsmen. Yeah, that is insulting. And the scope and the formality of the ceremony also seemed excessive to Tony's brothers. After all, it was the second marriage for both Tony and Harold. But in the end, Tony seemed happy, and that was all that really mattered. She looked beautiful. Right, and she looked happy, which was important. But I just, it does seem like a bit much to me for a second marriage, but if that's what she wanted, that's fine. There's no problem with that. Right. But he does seem like just he's starting off as a real jerk. So they had a honeymoon in Hawaii and began their life together. But Tony didn't see her family nearly as much. It did take her two years to sell her practice and make sure that the right person took it over, so she didn't move to Denver right away. But Harold became a frequent visitor to Mississippi, and he commuted more than Tony did between Jackson and Denver, so the couple were together quite a bit. Harold would come into town and he would stay with the Bertolettes. Her parents were in no hurry to see Tony move away. Tony and Yvonne were like best friends, and Yvonne, in addition to doing her books, she'd started doing all Tony's shopping after her divorce and helping out with the practice. Yeah, but Harold said he needed to be in Denver for his job. He did. From the beginning, he said he was a very wealthy man with this thriving business in Denver. And he said that Tony didn't have to work, and she could just be a mother if that's what she wanted. And remember, he said her income was insignificant compared to his. So from the start... The plan was that they would eventually move to Denver. Yes. Even though he said he was flexible and traveled a lot and he could pretty much live anywhere. Well, Denver was his home base for this business. Yep. So in 2002, when the practice was sold, Tony left Mississippi and moved to Colorado. After she moved into Harold's house, she got a job at Associates in Eye Care in Cherry Creek, and she became very active at the Cherry Hills Community Church there. They missed her, but her family had to admit that Denver seemed good for her. She really liked the outdoor activities like hiking that they had there. And she seemed happily married, saying that Harold was kind, caring, and very romantic. One other kind of strange thing to me is that Tony's parents paid for a deposit on a new home for them. Maybe it was yeah. a gift, but that's a little strange to me. It is to me, too. Uh, again, we're getting back with Harold's wealthier than anything. And Tony earns a good income, even though, as he says, it's insignificant compared yeah. to his. But they, they should be raking in the money. And they should have plenty to pay for a house. They should. 
So there's already some red flags there that he's not really telling the truth about this. There's plenty. But then in 2005, Tony gave birth to their daughter, Haley. Her main focus at that time was she wanted to be a good mom. It was a difficult birth. She was 43 at this time, and she had high blood pressure. Her labor progressed slowly, and she did end up with a C-section. But Haley was healthy. Everything went well. These are the mothers that, as a pediatrician, you just know you're going to get called to attend a delivery. (laughs) You have what they consider an elderly prima gravita which I always thought was funny. Which means someone over 35 having their first baby. First child, yeah. Yeah. So right away that puts her in a high-risk category. Then she has high blood pressure, and the labor's not progressing. So I know that they're going to be calling me at 2 in the morning to come attend a C-section. Right, yeah. Maybe it wasn't 2 for Tony, but (laughs) she did have the C-section. She did. Tony's parents flew out to see their grandchild and offer her support, and they were in the waiting room when Harold went in for the birth, and he came out bragging about his beautiful daughter and everything that he and the doctors had done. Yvonne and Robert went in and watched as the pediatrician examined Haley. Now Yvonne said that the baby touched the doctor's stethoscope, and she said, joking, you know, yes, she's going to be a doctor like her mom. But Harold didn't like that comment. He narrowed his eyes at her and said she will not be a doctor. So Yvonne was like, oh my goodness, that seems really odd that he said that to me. Yeah, particularly this baby's just minutes or hours old. Yeah. You know, (laughs) I've already got my mind made up. She's not going to be a doctor. Well, Harold was controlling, if anything. Yeah, if anything, more than anything. One example was that the TV couldn't be on when Haley was in the house. Now that's strange, you know, she's just a kid. Yeah, We always as pediatricians tell parents that you don't want to do too much TV time. Or screen time. Or screen time. Yeah. Um, But again, she's a few months old. Well, yeah, she's a little baby, so why can't Tony's parents watch the news? Right. And Harold took over most of the parenting of Haley, almost like Tony was the odd person out. She didn't get to decrease her work hours, even though Harold said she can be a stay-at-home mom and take care of the kids. And she actually ended up working more hours. And it turned out that even when she did get home from work in the evenings, Harold didn't give her enough time with Haley. Not much time at all. She worked all day. She wanted to come home and spend time with her baby. And he was possessive of the baby. He sure was. Very weird. And the people who worked with Tony didn't have a very good feeling about Harold. It seemed that he wanted to control her professional life along with her personal life. He was the only spouse in the practice who insisted on attending staff meetings. How awkward would that be? I know, poor Tony, huh? Yeah. That had to be embarrassing for her. And Harold took control of all the family finances. Then as time passed, Tony's communication with her family and friends became less frequent. Whenever a family member called her, Harold always answered the phone and would take a message. Well, yeah, they actually said that The only way they ever talked to Tony was on speakerphone with Harold there. With Harold in the background, right? Yeah. And during one visit to Denver, her mom asked Tony why she had stopped calling home. And Tony said, well, it's because none of them ever called her. Now, it turns out that Harold wasn't giving Tony any of the messages that her family had called. It seemed like Harold just wanted to control Tony completely. And at the same time, with all this happening, Tony's personality started to change a little bit. She seemed to be less social and more timid. And it's certainly not anything like Tony had been. No, and relationships like this do this to people. They do. She kind of gets beaten down after a while. And this wasn't like her at all. She had been very independent and strong-willed. But now we have this kind of beaten down woman, which is hard for her family to see. Her parents visited Denver when Tony had knee surgery, and Tony didn't want a knee replacement, so she had several surgeries, and they each took a real toll on her. Her mother went out to take care of her, and one night while she was there, she couldn't sleep. She got up and walked in the hallway, and as she was walking at about 2 a.m., she heard voices coming from Tony and Harold's room. They were arguing, and she overheard Harold say, If you tell your parents, I will divorce you. Yeah, now nobody knows what they were arguing about. 
No, but I think Tony really didn't want to get a divorce. She would be ashamed of it. It would be a failure to her. Yeah. Well, I think in, in that context, when he said, if you tell your parents, I will divorce you, I think she was starting to question him where his super income was. Absolutely. And she's starting to find out that he's a fraud. That there's to, really no job. There's no job, no income. And so he says, well, if you tell your parents that, I'll divorce you. Yeah. That's where I think that came from. I know. I'd say, well, good, buddy. Thanks. Get the hell out, you know. But her mom was really upset when she heard this. But she talked to her husband, Tony's dad, and they decided it really wasn't their business to get involved in the marriage. So she never asked Tony about it. But aside from once telling her mom that she was frustrated about their finances, Tony didn't ever complain about Harold. Her father believed that this went back to her first divorce. Tony's parents were married for over 50 years, so Tony really did see divorce as a failure on her part. So Tony just didn't want to say anything negative about her marriage, and she didn't want to get divorced a second time. And that was even more so after she had her daughter Haley. Divorce just it wasn't an option for her. She was extremely religious, and she sincerely believed that marriage was a lifelong commitment. Unfortunately, she just didn't realize that her husband was more than just a liar. He was a dangerous man. Yeah, they owned a cabin in Grand Lake, and this was a fishing and boating resort on the southeastern border of Rocky Mountain National Park. In 2011, they had spent Memorial Day weekend there with Haley. About 10 o'clock one night, Harold was out on the back deck cleaning up uh, there, even though it was kind of late. He called Tony out onto the deck, and just as she stepped out onto the deck, a large wooden beam fell and hit Tony on the back of her neck. Now, she was seriously injured. Uh, and in fact, if uh, it had hit her in the head, it might have killed her. And she was always telling people that she's so happy that she had been bending down to pick something up on the floor when it hit her. Yeah. So it could have been even more severe. Yeah, but she was seriously injured, and Harold never notified her family. They found out later from Tony, it was about three weeks after it happened, and Harold said it was no big deal, but that's not really accurate. She had some severe pain shooting through her body, and she fell to the ground. She was numb all over, she had tingling in her fingers, and Harold had to call 911. The ambulance had taken her to the ER at a small local hospital, but they were afraid she may have broken her back, so they transported her to the Swedish Medical Center in Denver about 90 miles away. Fortunately, she hadn't broken any vertebrae, but she still had severe pain for a while. She had to have physical therapy, but the pain and the tingling continued for several months. She told her family the story like this. Harold called Tony out of the cabin. When she walked through the doorway, she saw something on the deck and looked down. When she bent down to pick it up, that's when a beam hit her on the back of her neck. So, like you said, if she hadn't bent down, the beam would have hit her on the head, and it definitely could have killed her. At least could have caused much more serious injury right. than she suffered. And she also had believed that Harold had told her family, but he hadn't. Yes, he was very closed mouth about this. So it's all very shaky. <laughs> more than shaky. But again, we, we get the benefit of hindsight. Yes, exactly. So it was December of 2011... Tony visited her parents without Harold, and this is when they had a rare chance to talk openly. Yvonne told Tony that she thought the beam hitting her was not an accident. She also told Tony that she shouldn't go anywhere alone with Harold. How do you like that? M mother, mother's advice. I think your husband's <laughs> trying to kill you, and you shouldn't go anywhere alone with him. Wow. How alarming. Isn't it? It is, but, you know, she didn't want to believe it, so Tony ignored that advice. And she told her mother, oh, you're just too suspicious. Yvonne was so concerned, though, that she asked her husband to hire a private eye to check out Harold. But unfortunately, Robert refused, saying he thought it would be wrong to do that to Tony's husband. In June of 2012, Tony opened her first individual bank account since marrying Harold Henthorne. And she started diverting money from a joint account into this individual account. So we probably surmise that Harold was aware of the money being transferred. Well, he'd have to be because he was in charge of their finances. He knew so everything. Yeah. He would know this was a significant amount of money that was removed from the joint account. Right. 
Now, we also know that after this, uh, after Tony had opened the individual bank account, Harold started making trips to Rocky Mountain National Park. And we know that he made nine trips. These trips were all backed up by cell phone records, which could trace his movements. The trips started August 16th and ended September 20th. Now, Harold never told anyone about these trips. On September 9th of 2012, he went to the Rocky Mountain National Park for most of the day. This was a Sunday. The next day, he talked to Tony's office manager, Tammy Abruscato, about arranging a fake patient schedule so that he could surprise Tony and take her away for their anniversary. So that sounded like a nice thing to do. Oh, certainly. Then he went to the park again on September 16th. So at some point, he must have found the location he was looking for. Saturday, September 29th, 2012, was the eve of their 12th anniversary, their 12th wedding anniversary. On the weekend of their anniversary, Harold told people that they were going to the Stanley Hotel, but he didn't mention that they had a hiking trip planned. They were going to the Stanley to have a nice time as a couple, and as part of that, they might go on some walks or some easy hikes. Now, the Stanley is a famous hotel, right? Yes. Do you know what it's famous for? Besides the fact that it's a beautiful, grand hotel? It's from The Shining. Jack Nicholson. Haunting, yeah. Yeah, that's the Stanley Hotel. It's amazing. So that was a nice place to take her. It was. It's a gorgeous place. So after they spent Friday night at the Stanley, they took pictures of their hotel room and of themselves on the grounds that Saturday morning. They left for a hike at 1.30 p.m., They veered off the trail, Harold claimed, to get away from people so they could have some private time. But photos they took showed that nobody was around that day. Although Harold called the path that they veered off on a use trail, there was no trail. Once they left the established Deer Mountain Trail, they were actually on their own. And Tony was then dependent on Harold to get them back to the trail, as they're basically in woods and rocks. Yeah, when we were watching the 48 Hours show about this. Yeah, they had some great footage of the area to give you a good idea. This is extremely rough terrain. Absolutely. I wouldn't do it. Well, you don't like that stuff anyway. But no, it doesn't look like it was a place that an inexperienced hiker would be going. No. Particularly one with knee trouble. And on a romantic walk. Right. Yeah. So they finished their picnic lunch and it was nearly 4 o'clock. And they had 7 o'clock dinner reservations at a very expensive restaurant. But instead of heading back, they went down a pile of loose stones to the spot where Tony did go off the cliff. Now, what they were supposed to be doing was that they were taking pictures, they saw some wild turkeys or something. Well, there were various stories. He various. said that they wanted to have romantic time, which it was very rocky. There really wasn't an area to have romantic time. <laughs> I don't <laughs> Unless you like having sex on a rock. Yeah. And then he also said that uh, she saw turkeys, and when someone questioned, are there really turkeys at that elevation, he said, well, at least there were deer there. So his stories changed quite a bit with different people and at different times. Right. So at 5.54 p.m., Harold called 911. His voice sounded urgent, but controlled. The cell phone reception was pretty clear. He reached the park's emergency dispatch center and he said that he needed an Alpine Mountain rescue team immediately. My wife has fallen from a rock on the north summit of Deer Mountain on the Deer Mountain Trail. She's in really critical condition. She's had a bad fall. And that's what he said on the phone. Yeah, and when asked how far she had fallen, Harold said 30 to 40 feet. He wanted to give his location first, claiming that he had really bad cell reception. So he was able to give his location in latitude and longitude coordinates. He said that Tony had respirations of about 5 to 8. He said beats per minute, which was weird. And that her pulse was between 60 and 80 beats per minute. Harold asked if they could get a helicopter to fly Tony to a trauma center. He said that he would pay all expenses for the helicopter. But it wasn't a matter of money, of course. It wasn't safe to fly a helicopter to where she was. Yeah, I mean, they're they're in such a remote area that it was pretty impossible to take a helicopter in there. Yeah, so rangers had to hike out to find them. And Harold got instructions on how to do CPR from one of the dispatchers. He said his cell phone battery was low, so he hung up and then called back the dispatcher a few times. 
and in between speaking with the dispatcher, Harold texted Tony's brother Barry, and that kind of makes his uh, low battery story a lie. I mean, if, if you got a low battery, turn it off and keep it off. Don't keep turning it on and off. You're going to texting people or texting. You're going to suck up all the rest of the life of the battery. Yes, I find the whole texting the brother thing strange. I mean, the brother is in another state. There's nothing he can do. He should be concentrating on taking care of her and giving her CPR. It's very odd. Well, he's setting his alibi, right? Absolutely. So he texted Barry, urgent. Tony is injured in Estes Park, fall from rock, critical. Requested flight for life. EMT rangers on way. Please come to Denver next flight. Low cell bat. Please return message. And when Barry didn't immediately respond to the text, Harold also called and left a voicemail using more battery. He said, check your phone. I have a low cell battery and can't talk. Barry did respond with a text asking Harold if he needed help, and Harold replied with an H, which Barry took to mean that he did need help. Now, Barry called the National Park Service dispatchers while more texts were coming in from Harold. One of them came in at 8.25 p.m. Eastern Time, which meant it was 6.25 p.m. in Denver, and it read Pulse 60, Respiration 5 which doesn't sound too bad. That's okay. She's got spontaneous breathing and she's got a heart rate. What's the status? Barry texted to Harold at 6.39 p.m. Denver time. No min pulse, Harold replied. Then Harold texted at 7.12 p.m. CPR crit. Not sure what all that means. Barry texted back, is the ranger there? And Harold texted no. Then about 7.30 p.m. Harold texted, can't find pulse. Yeah, so Barry texts back to, to Harold. Maybe it's still there, because after all, he's a cardiologist. He knows. He says, keep up with CPR. Well, sure, because she could have a very faint pulse sure. that a layperson wouldn't recognize. And at 7.55 p.m., Harold texted Barry again, CPR, help is 10 minutes out. He's doing a lot of, a lot of work on that phone with such a low battery. Well, there's the low battery, and then if you're doing CPR, that's hard, constant work. How do you have time to do this? He can multitask. Yeah, doesn't make any sense. No. The dispatcher called Harold back to help him with CPR instructions, and she told him to continue giving two breaths and then 30 chest compressions. And his answer was, that's exactly what I've been doing. You're telling me exactly what I've been doing. And this dispatcher said, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to count for you as you go through the breaths. I've got my computer on so I can count, so we can make sure that we're getting the right blood flow. But Harold didn't do that. He spoke over her and said something again about his cell battery and that he had to turn off his phone. He did call the dispatcher one last time at 8.01 p.m. The ranger by then was just a few feet away, carefully going down the slope toward Harold. Park ranger Mark Faraday was guided by the light of a small fire, and he found Harold at the base of the cliff. Faraday would say that this was a scene unlike any he'd seen before. The first thing Harold did when he came toward him from the woods was run over to Tony. She was lying on her back on the hard ground with her head wrapped in cloth, and Harold started pushing down on her chest. So, acting like he's doing CPR, but apparently he hadn't been doing it before the guy showed up. No, he had been sitting there, waiting. So Faraday told Harold to stop and went to take over. Tony was wearing her blue jeans, a pink polo shirt, and some brown boots. And blood had soaked her blonde hair. She had a severe head wound. Some people had even described it as being scalped. She wasn't moving at all. She didn't look alive. And Ranger Faraday checked for any vital signs. Tony had no pulse and she wasn't breathing. At 8.12 p.m., Ranger Faraday called the Rocky Mountain National Park's incident command post and reported that Tony Henthorne had died. In the meantime, Barry Bertolet had called his brother Todd, and Todd, who lived near to the parents, went to their house. Within 30 to 40 minutes, Barry called Todd to tell him that Tony had died. So Todd had to tell his parents, and he said this was the hardest thing he'd ever done. The family immediately felt that Harold had killed Tony. So that tells you something, that their minds immediately went to that. So why don't we take a quick break here and hear from our sponsors. Good idea. Let's do that. Today's episode is sponsored by ADT, Real Protection. When it comes to something as important as your family's safety, 
you deserve real protection from ADT. For me, real protection means the nation's number one smart home security provider is standing by and there for you when you need them. Real protection means having a safe and smart home with everything from video doorbells, surveillance cameras, smart locks, lights, carbon monoxide and smoke detectors in a system that's been custom designed to fit your lifestyle and setting up custom automations to do things like lock the doors and set the thermostat when you leave. Real protection means staying safe on the go, in the car or when your kids are at school, with the ADT Go app and an SOS button. Real protection means 18,000 employees safeguarding you. Real protection means direct connections with first responders. So no matter how you define safety for you, your family, or your business, ADT is there. ADT, real protection. Visit ADT.com forward slash podcast to learn more about how ADT can design and install a secure smart home just for you. Take coloring your hair to the next level with one of my favorite beauty products, Madison Reed Hair Color. For as long as I can remember, there were two options for coloring my hair. Outdated at home color, the stuff you pick up at the grocery or the drugstore, or the considerable financial and time investment of visiting the salon. We're busy women, and you shouldn't have to be rich to have multi-tonal hair coloring crafted by master colorists. And that's what makes Madison Reed Color unique. It's that it's crafted by master colorists who blend nuances of light, dark, cool, and warm to create over 45 gorgeous multi-tonal shades to choose from. You deserve gorgeous professional hair color that's delivered to your door for less than $25. And many Madison Reed clients have commented on how their new hair color has improved their lives. And I count myself among these clients. Madison Reed gives me great gray coverage, game-changing blonde locks that I can maintain at home. And I feel like I just came out of the salon. I thought I was really chained to monthly salon visits for life and I never thought I'd color my hair at home again. But Madison Reed has truly liberated me. My hair is shiny and healthy, and I get this quality, nuanced color with the convenience of home delivery, my favorite thing. That's why I'm happy to recommend Madison Reed to our listeners. You can join me in finding your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. True Crime Brewery listeners get 10% off plus free shipping on their first color kit by using the code BREWERY. That's code BREWERY at madison-reed.com. Back to the story. According to Harold, he and Tony had left the trail because it was too crowded. Although, as you said, Jill, there were photos taken that belie that story. They had come to the top of a mountain where Tony had used binoculars to look down at some wild turkeys. Harold said that while he was preoccupied with his phone, she didn't make any noise and over the cliff she went. Now, they couldn't get a helicopter or get her extracted, her body extracted, so a park ranger guarded Tony's body overnight, and then the next morning the scene could be examined better, and she could be transported more safely by park rangers. But Harold was escorted away that night. He was. And that's the sensible thing to do. That's how you do it, yeah. And they said he didn't protest too much about leaving her. No. No. The park investigators found a map in Harold's Jeep in the glove compartment. This was a standard Park Service map which is given to all visitors at Rocky Mountain National Park. showed the roads, campgrounds, hiking trails, and the surrounding area. In the upper right-hand corner, there is a circle and pink highlighter that was drawn around Nikki's Steakhouse in Estes Park. And that's the fancy restaurant where Harold and Tony were going to eat that night. Yeah, they had reservations. Inside the park, the Deer Mountain Trail was highlighted, and in the area where Tony died, in pink highlighter, there was an X. So that was suspicious. Very suspicious, isn't it? Very. Ranger Faraday asked Harold about this, but Harold suddenly became at a loss for words. Faraday said that Harold hemmed and hawed before saying that he wasn't sure why there was an X there. Then Harold said the map probably was intended for a hike that had nothing to do with this anniversary weekend. Yeah, we're going to go some other time. Yeah, but I mean, that's really, I think he made a big mistake there, leaving that map in the Jeep. Well, I guess he's not the smartest guy that he thought he was. So there is an obituary that later appeared in local papers. 
I read that Tony was a faithful Christian, loving wife, devoted mother, thoughtful daughter and sister, and an incredibly skilled physician. After those first and second day news reports and the obituary, Tony's death received no more coverage in Colorado or Mississippi. There were no follow-up news stories identifying who the caller was who alerted rangers or the fact that Tony had been hiking with her husband. In fact, there was nothing at all said about Harold Henthorne. Right, but behind the scenes, there was a lot being said about Harold. From the moment he saw Harold and Tony, Ranger Faraday felt something was not right. It wasn't just that a park visitor had died in an accident. Tony was actually one of 143 people who had died in America's national parks that year, from everything from slips and falls to drownings. But more than half of the search and rescues are for people in their 20s. The largest number of those killed in 2012 were between the ages of 20 and 29, which is much younger than the Henthorns, who were in their early 50s. The Henthorns didn't seem very well prepared for the hike they had taken. They had set off in the afternoon for a six-mile round trip over steep terrain that would make it tough to get back before sunset. And the only flashlight that Faraday could find was the small keychain pen light that Harold was carrying. Now the couple had left the trail to go through a forest to the edge of a precipice. Then they went down a, a pretty harrowing steep slope to the edge of another cliff. They're doing this as it's getting late and miles of trail were between them and their car. And remember, they got dinner reservations. Well, sure, nobody wants to be out hiking at night. Unless you're like a professional hiker, why would you do that? It was really suspicious, too, how Harold had ran over to his wife and started chest compressions just as Faraday was arriving. Harold had claimed that he'd been trying to revive Tony all evening. But as an experienced emergency medical technician, Faraday knew that this probably wasn't true. For one thing, Tony had been wearing lipstick, which would have transferred to Harold if he'd done mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. But a close look at Harold showed that his face was clean and that Tony's lipstick was still pretty intact on her lips. In the daylight, the rangers could see that Tony really hadn't landed where her body was lying. Faraday estimated that she had fallen more than 100 feet, and I think they ended up saying it was 140 feet. It was a significant height. And Harold had really underestimated this distance in the 911 call, saying it was 30 or 40 feet. Tony had actually crashed through pine trees, severing a pretty big branch, and landed in or near a tree. A trail of blood showed that she had then been moved several feet to where she was. Her hands had no scrapes or cuts. There was no flashlight, like someone would take for a hike that was going to last into the evening. And her camera was next to her body, but it had very little damage. If she had had it with her, it wouldn't have been right there with her, and it probably would have been more damaged. Right. And what Harold had told investigators or, or the family or both was that he had moved Tony so he could perform CPR, but he said he pulled her by her legs and her head was thumping on the rocks. Oh my God, who would do that? Exactly. But he's trying to show what a caring husband he is by allowing her head to be bouncing up and down on rocks as he moves her. And he was a big enough guy. He could have cradled her head and carried her in a much more compassionate and reasonable way. I mean, like they said, she had a severe head injury anyway. So this is pretty horrific. The rangers strapped Tony Henthorn's body to a gurney, carried it three miles to a trailhead, and from there back to the base. Then it was transported to McKee Medical Center in Loveland, Colorado, which is about 30 miles to the east, for an autopsy. The Bertolette's suspicions about Harold came from both his behavior, since they knew him, and from the information Harold had texted about Tony's condition after her fall. As a doctor, Barry knew the vital signs Harold reported to him just didn't make sense. The declining respiration and heartbeat that Harold seemed so worried about would actually have been a good sign to Barry. It would have meant that Tony had not gone into shock. So the truth was that Tony had probably been dead for hours before the rangers even arrived on the scene. Do you have any comments on that as a physician, the vital sign situation, the head injury? Well, if she was going into shock, her pulse would have gone higher and higher because the body's trying to pump more blood. From the blood loss. Right. So, as Barry said, yeah, those are fairly reassuring vital signs. 
at that point, he didn't realize that she'd fallen so damn far either. No, he's going on what Harold's relaying to him. Yes. So the medical examiner provided the autopsy findings to Harold and the Bertolette family. Harold got angry because the coroner had not ruled out homicide. It was indeterminate, is what they said. Yes, undetermined. For cause of death. And he was also not very nice to Ranger Faraday. He called him Barney Fife. Then he also argued with Tony's family over funeral arrangements. The family wanted her body flown in Mississippi for burial, but Harold said he couldn't afford that. Mr. Big Bucks. Yeah, what does that even mean? <laughs> How does that even make sense that he couldn't afford it? No sense. No. And then when the Bertolettes said they'd pay for the arrangements, Harold said that a cremation had to be done as soon as possible. Well, there was a viewing of Tony's body that took place the Wednesday after her death. Barry had spoken with the coroner and said that the family had suspicions about Tony's death. So Barry and Tony's mom gazed into the casket and took a long look at her daughter's body. And they could tell that her neck had been broken. The right side of her head was smashed in. And on her left hand where the ring was, there wasn't even a scratch on her hand. But her $30,000 diamond was missing from her engagement ring. The rangers had searched, but the stone was not found. And when asked about this missing diamond, Harold made the statement that it was worth $30,000, which seems like a strange comment to mention the value of it under those circumstances. And suspiciously, when rangers returned to that site the following May, which was about eight months later, they found the diamond on the ground. In plain sight. Yes. Where it couldn't have been missed or would be unlikely to have been missed on a search. Well, yeah, and it couldn't sit there for eight months and not get any debris on it or anything. Probably not. Further investigation of Tony's death raised questions about Harold's version of events. Now, for example, Harold told a ranger that he and Tony first planned to hike the Bear Lake Trail, which was a half a mile of paved, handicapped, accessible walking with no elevation. He explained that they switched to Deer Mountain Trail at the last second to avoid crowds. Deer Mountain Trail is quite different. It's a three-mile hike, climbing 1,200 feet from its trailhead to a 10,200-foot summit, a really odd choice for Tony, who'd had three knee surgeries and whose injuries left her unable to ski. I don't know how he even got her to go on this walk. Yeah, I mean, if that was you and me, <laughs> you, you would have taken one look and said, uh-uh. I wouldn't even have gotten in the car, honey. Harold also pretended to be unfamiliar with the park, and he told a ranger that he had only made one trip there. But phone records did show that he visited the park nine times in the six weeks before Tony's death. Harold described their trip away from the main trail to the off-trail lunch spot and cliff where Tony fell as a spontaneous decision because they wanted to get away from crowds, find a romantic spot, or see wild turkeys or deer. And investigators figured out that he was very familiar with that spot where Tony died. Evidence of Harold's communications during and after was also pretty troubling. For example, he reported certain vital signs, but the vitals that he gave were very inconsistent with Tony's injuries. During that 911 call that began at 5.54 p.m., he told the dispatchers that Tony had a head injury, a pulse of 60 to 80, and respirations of 5 to 8. He later told Barry, Tony's brother, that Tony's pulse was 60 and respirations 5. And at 6.32, he told 911 dispatchers that Tony's breathing was shallow and he was about to start CPR. But given her injuries, Dr. James Wilkerson, the Larimer County Coroner and Chief Medical Examiner, who was qualified by the court as an expert forensic pathologist, estimated that Tony died between 20 and 60 minutes after her fall. Yeah, remember that the fall was way more than Harold had estimated in his 911 call. Yeah, and we find out that he didn't actually call 911 until after he climbed down to where she was. Right. Which could have taken him as long as 45 minutes. Well, it was a, over a 100-foot fall. Yes, it was. So that's significant, right? Of course, sure. And she hit a tree on the way down, which might have been where her scalp was peeled back from her head. Because, as you said, she was, in a sense, scalped. And then she hit the ground after hitting this huge tree and landed apparently either in the tree or on the ground on her right side, where it broke several ribs, vertebrae, it lacerated her liver. It was a significant enough impact that it 
blew out her breast implant that she'd had. So a significant trauma. And she could have died from a number of things, whether it was from the scalp wound that was causing a huge amount of blood loss, the tear in the liver would have meant for a lot of blood. This poor lady was doomed. And she did probably die very quickly with those significant injuries. And to find out that he didn't call 911 until he had gotten down there, which could have taken a number of minutes, the most likely thing, the most likely scenario is that she was dead by the time he got down there. Yeah. And everything he's telling to investigators or dispatchers or EMT personnel is a lie. Well, she's bleeding to death. She's not going to have a pulse of 60. Probably not. And we know she was bleeding to death because she had major wounds that were bleeding. Both internally and externally. Exactly. So that must have been a mess. Well, another thing, the investigation finally revealed that Harold had taken out several large life insurance policy son, Tony, prior to her death and had recently made himself the beneficiary of a life insurance annuity that originally named their daughter as the beneficiary. Yeah, but Harold changed that, took her off and put his name in. At the time of Tony's death, Harold had three $1.5 million life insurance policies on Tony, also a $205,000 annuity, so he stood to collect more than $4.7 million from her death. But when a ranger asked about Tony's life insurance, Harold only mentioned a $1 million policy for the couple's daughter and a potential $50,000 policy from a recent car purchase. He also told some other people that He couldn't even touch that money. It was for his daughter. When she reached of age, she would get it. So vastly underestimating what he had to gain from this. Well, sure. You don't want to give them fuel to think that you did something for your wife's money. Well, sure, but you've already purchased it. How would they not know? Well, he's hoping they won't investigate, I guess. Right. Which is what happened with the first wife, which we'll get to. The police and a Denver investigative reporter received tips then asking them to investigate Tony's death. Some actually pointed to Harold as the person to look at. An investigation revealed that Harold's first wife had also died under some very suspicious circumstances. Yeah, Harold had given various stories over the years about how his first wife had died. In one story, she had died in a head-on automobile collision. But Sandra Lynn Henthorne had died in a very strange accident. And what had happened to her was that Harold's Jeep had crushed her when they were changing a tire, and this according to Harold. There were some suspicious circumstances surrounding the death of Lynn, she went by Lynn, and that was in 1995. According to Harold, he and his wife were driving at night on Highway 67 in Douglas County when he said that his right front tire felt soft. He said he stopped to change the tire, and his wife had crawled under the Jeep to retrieve a lug nut. Harold said the jack slipped and the vehicle landed on her. She died early the next morning, but prior to that incident, Harold had also taken out a large life insurance policy on Lynn. Another thing is that Harold secretly took out a $400,000 life insurance policy on Grace Rischel, who was married to Lynn's brother, in which he named himself as the primary beneficiary. So Grace believed that Harold had probably planned on murdering her at some point. Well, I don't think there's any question. He inserted himself into her family. She was divorced from Lynn's brother. There wasn't really any major reason to stay close to them. And this all happened after Lynn had died. This happened after Lynn died. He was a good uncle to the four girls that Grace had. And even though she said it didn't seem like he was romantically interested in her, that's what was going on. You think so? There's no question. I mean, I think he he was going to kill her. I don't know about the romantic part. Okay, possibly. But I think he was trying to insert himself into their life. He was a great uncle to the kids and did a lot of things with them. He did, yep. The 1995 file for Lynn Henthorne was examined after Tony's death by investigators, and it did contain medical records from Swedish Hospital documenting her arrival by helicopter and the efforts that were made to save her. And it also had the autopsy report. There was a report saying that the manner of death was an accident. There were no supporting investigative reports. The gap between the injuries described by the autopsy report and the finding of an accidental death really seemed unsupportable, at least by the small amount of documentation that was found in the file. These issues factored into a federal grand jury indictment for first-degree murder against Harold for Tony's death. 
And meanwhile, the new charges brought new attention to the death of Lynn, which was also supposed to have been accidental. In a statement, U.S. Attorney John Walsh pointed out that in 1995, Harold Henthorne's prior wife, Lynn, died from injuries sustained from being crushed by a car while he was changing a tire in a remote location. The car allegedly came off the jack as he was throwing the tire into the trunk, crushing his wife, who was under the car for unknown reasons. There were no witnesses other than Harold, and a life insurance policy on her had been taken out just months prior. So going over the day that Lynn died, Harold said that he and his wife began their day at mid-morning doing things around the house. Between 5.45 p.m. and 6 p.m., Lynn had said she wanted to go out, so they took Highway 85, also known as Santa Fe Drive, south to Sedalia, then turned west on Highway 67 toward the mountains. Following the South Platte River, they followed the twisting road for 70 miles as it rose up the Rockies until they got to the Cheeseman Reservoir. Yeah, and they only stayed a few minutes there because they were hungry, and they headed back towards Sedalia to go to the Sedalia Grill. Now, along the way, Harold was concerned about his tires. He said that he had some remodeling going on at his house, and there had been nails in the driveway. So he said he had had several flat tires. So as they're heading towards Sedalia, Harold felt the tire was getting softer, and he pulled to the left side of the road on a wide, flat area to change the tire. Harold explained that Lynn spread a plastic shower curtain on the ground as he first tried using the black factory jack. This jack didn't work, so Harold removed two boat jacks, one silver, one orange, from the jeep while Lynn put the black jack away. The boat jacks were smaller than the factory jack, and they weren't designed to lift a vehicle. And I don't also say, why were they in the car? Right. So Lynn found a broken piece of flat cinder block and Harold put the silver jack under the axle on top of the cinder block. Then he said he warned her to stay at least six feet away from the car, and Harold removed the lug nuts. So Lynn was holding the lug nuts in a rag in her left hand and was shining the flashlight that she held in her right so Harold could see what he was doing. Around this time, a car came by with two or three people inside, and they asked if they needed help. And Harold said, now we're fine. After removing the supposedly flat tire, Harold carried it to the back of the Jeep. The spear was on the front wheel. Harold said he threw the flat tire into the back of the Jeep, which bounced back out. The spare tire was unbolted. This is one of those things where, you know, those Jeeps that have the tire on the hatchback. And it was hanging on by one bolt. He threw the flat tire into the back of the Jeep, which bounced back out. And as it did that, the spare tire fell off the rack and then he said he saw the car go down. So if the tire had bounced out of the hatch, how had it ended up on top of another tire? Good question. Harold suggested that someone else picked up the spare tire off the ground later and put it back in the Jeep. Lynn had dropped a lug nut or a flashlight, but he wasn't sure. As the car went down, Lynn called his name and Harold saw that she was pinned. According to Harold, Lynn said, I think something's on me. Somehow, Harold said he got the silver jack that had been under the axle back in place, and he noticed that the cinder block was broken in three places. He got the car lifted, and Lynn was talking in a very strained voice. He said he knew Lynn was very seriously hurt and thought she had a broken back. Then within a few minutes, a car full of people stopped by, and they asked Harold if he needed help. Now He said he called to them to get an ambulance. Lynn, at this point, is lying on the shower curtain face down, and it stopped talking. When asked how Lynn had gotten out from under the Jeep, Harold didn't know if he pulled Lynn out from under the car or one of the uh, people that stopped to help did. Lynn wasn't breathing, and the people who had stopped started doing CPR on her. They also put coats and blankets on Lynn. Then there were a few other people who had stopped to make sure help was coming, uh, and they left. Harold wasn't sure who they were group of people wanted to leave prior to the arrival of fire or police because they had been drinking. So they didn't want to get any repercussions from that. Right, which seems a little selfish. Yeah. Then the rescue workers arrived. Yeah, Denver resident Patricia Montoya said that she and three other adults, Joseph and Manuel Montoya and Maxine Southern, were driving along Highway 67 shortly before 10 p.m. that night when they saw Harold on the street flagging them down. She said that he told them he needed help and that a car had fallen on his wife and she was underneath not breathing. 
That's when they tried CPR and covered Lynn with one of their coats, and that was before the police arrived. Lifting the Jeep with a floor jack, investigators looked at the front axle and found slight scrape marks on the area where Harold had said the silver jack slipped off. They measured the width of the exposed rotor and determined that it was consistent with the space between the two straight marks left on Lynn's back. The Lynn Henthorne case actually was wrapped up within days, but Tony Henthorne's case would be worked on for years. Tony's case had many parallels with the death of Lynn. There were two wives and two deaths in remote locations under unusual circumstances, with Harold as the only witness. Both times Harold gave very inconsistent stories, and even the vehicles were the same. They were Jeeps. And one similarity really stood out. There were large insurance policies on both wives, payable payable to Harold upon their deaths. He had no business in his name, no income of his own, or any clients that they could find. But he told investigators that he was financially secure, a successful fundraiser for nonprofits like churches and hospitals. So he's still lying to them. I don't know how he doesn't think they're going to figure out that he has no job. Well, you're in for it now, so you might as well try to lie your way out. I guess so. Let's give a little background on Lynn. Okay. Sandra Lynn Henthorne had grown up in Potomac, Maryland, in a big close-knit family with a sister and two brothers. As a child, she had the nickname Linny Bin, but by adult life she went by Lynn. She studied ballet, had performed in the Nutcracker Suite. She had bright red hair and a radiant smile. At James Madison University in Virginia, she majored in social work and psychology, and she met Harold in college. He was studying geology. Now, he was a couple years older than Lynn, and they became boyfriend-girlfriend. After graduation, they married in Colorado in September of 1982, and her family really fell in love with Harold. He struck them as strong and smart, good with money, and very organized. It was Harold, not Lynn, who handled all of the wedding arrangements. On weekends, Lynn would go out and visit yard sales looking for baby cribs to donate to low-income families. She learned sign language so she could communicate with her deaf and hearing-impaired clients. And although she had painful arthritis in her ankles, she wasn't a complainer. She really lived an active life. When she moved to Colorado with Harold, she really enjoyed the outdoor activities there. So Lynn's life seemed to be missing only one thing. According to her, she wanted to have children. She had fibroids, and she was planning surgery to have them removed when she died. It was late on a Saturday night when her family got the news of her death, and they were shocked, of course. They didn't want to interfere with the police investigation, and they had no suspicions about Harold at the time. But looking back, they did find aspects of Lynn's death confusing. Lynn was always careful. Why would she crawl under a Jeep that was just up on a jet? Why indeed. (laughs) Yeah, right. Right. Now, and Harold also struck the family as very safety conscious, who didn't take any chances. But whatever doubts the family might have had, they were satisfied when the investigation quickly ended and it was termed an accidental death. So they trusted the investigation. They did. But some close to Lynn were more skeptical. Longtime family friend Mike Walters later told Inside Edition, When I heard this story that she had crawled underneath the car on a jack, I just didn't believe it. Lynn's boss, Nancy Hodges, had already expressed her skepticism about the death being an accident. She said it remained a topic of conversation between her and a co-worker for years afterwards. Well, yeah. Think about it. Oh, I have. You and I are changing a tire. I'm a little worried that you keep comparing these wife deaths right. to us. <laughs> a guy and his wife were changing a tire. <laughs> okay. And he says to his wife, Honey, I, I dropped a lug nut underneath the wheel. Can you get it for me? Because I can't squeeze underneath there. You're slender. You're more able to get underneath and get the lug nut. Well, when someone calls me slender, I'll do just about anything they ask. Okay. (laughs) But not that, no. And and she willingly does that. And then the car falls on her. Well, no, it's very unbelievable. It sure is. To me, it's more suspicious than Tony's death, which is very suspicious. I think so. It's terrible. Because I just, I can almost buy a uh, accidental fall much more easily than, geez, a car fell on top of me. Yes, I agree. Back in 1995, investigators found that Lynn Henthorne's life was insured for $300,000. While the physical evidence was gone, insurance records were still available. 
So even after 20 years, when they're investigating Tony Henthorne's death, people could follow the money trail and discover that there were two more policies on Lynn Henthorne that Harold hadn't mentioned. Right. There was one, there was a regular life insurance policy for $150,000. There was an auto policy payable in the event of an accidental death involving an automobile. So the policies amounted actually to 600000 double what Harold had told the police. And of course, Harold was the beneficiary. Well, sure. A recreation of Lynn's death was done. The first was whether she could have physically done what Harold said she did. So from the original reports, Lynn had somehow gotten under the jeep on her stomach. The autopsy found that parallel marks on her back matched the shape and measurements of the brake assembly. And based on the measurements and photos taken at the scene, the jeep used for the recreation was positioned as close to the same position and lifted to the same height as it was in 1995. And an orange mini traffic cone had been placed where one of the lug nuts was found. So a female detective who was about Lynn's size walked around the front of the jeep, got down onto her stomach. Her body thickness measured 8 inches, and that enabled her to fit under the jeep in the brake assembly. She had to contort herself a little bit to get to the position that Lynn would have been for the jeep to fall on her and leave the marks as they were described in the autopsy report. So the reenactment concluded that it was actually possible for Lynn to have gotten into that position, but it would have been difficult. Then a second test examined whether the lug nuts could have ended up in the positions that they did. Remember that according to Harold, Lynn had been holding the flashlight in one hand and the lug nuts in the other. It wasn't known exactly where she was positioned at the time. Logic would say that Lynn had to have been standing somewhere close to the right front tire where Harold was working the wrench. So for this test, they brought the reenactment jeep out to Highway 67 near Sedalia. The vague and inconsistent descriptions from the reports of the location of the jeep made it impossible to find the exact spot. So the best they could do is make an educated guess. A crime scene investigator stood next to the right front passenger tire and dropped a handful of nuts the way Lynn may have done while Harold was throwing the soft tire into the hatch. And this was done several times. They were dropped from different heights and different places. The lug nut that Lynn would have been reaching for when the Jeep went down was, according to reports, located 22 inches inside the wheel drum. But in this test, not a single lug nut landed anywhere near that. The nuts wouldn't on their own roll that far under the Jeep somebody would have had to toss them. So this is helpful to me, but this is not really science. Well, no, there's too many variables. Right. But it, it does give you some information. Yes, it does. And I think the, the shape of the lug nuts would have made it very difficult for them to roll. Especially on a dirt surface. Right. Yeah. So anyway. Well, the last test they did was to determine how the Jeep could have come off the jack or the jacks. They hoisted the test jeep using a similar kind of jack that Harold had used, placing the jack under the front axle as Harold said that he did. All the tires were filled with the same air pressure as measured at the time of the incident. With the jeep on the jack and the right front tire removed, they recreated what Harold said he did next. They tried various ways of placing the tire in the back of the jeep, but nothing knocked the jeep from the jack. Actually, the jeep never moved. They kept trying, tossing the tire every which way into the back of the Jeep from different angles using different force. And the Jeep was really steady. The only way they could get the Jeep to go off the jack was when someone went to the passenger side and pushed it from the same place where investigators had found a footprint. This was on the passenger side of the front fender. And that's where they found a footprint back when the incident had occurred. Another thing to note is that the tire wasn't even flat. It had 30 pounds of pressure, I believe, in a tire that required 50. I don't know if it was 30, but it it wasn't. It wasn't flat by any means. No. They could have driven home. And experts said that they could have easily gotten home. So why would you stop on a dark road to change a tire when you don't have to? Because I'm going to drop a car on my wife. Yeah. In the years following Lynn's death, Harold continued to tell different versions also about what happened. But he did maintain a good relationship with Lynn's family, and they were actually happy for him when he met and fell in love with Tony. Yeah, they're looking at him as this poor, lonely widower. Yeah, they gave him a lot of credit. And how nice it was that he found somebody. They were. Federal investigators are thoroughly investigating Harold Henthorne in Tony's death. 
and they determined, first of all, that Harold hadn't worked for at least 20 years. Now, after she was dead, Harold told other people that Tony knew he wasn't employed. Anybody who was close to Tony didn't believe that. Not at all. So then Harold went and hired an attorney and refused to speak to anyone. Yep. In November of 2014, Harold was arrested and he was charged by federal authorities with the first-degree murder of Tony. A judge ruled that the circumstances of Lynn's death could be presented at the trial for Tony's murder. And that was a big thing. If they weren't able to put up the information about Lynn's death, I don't know if he would have been found guilty. Maybe not. And, and weren't they also allowed to present as evidence the uh, beam that fell and struck Tony? Yeah, that incident was also allowed to be used. Yeah. So he went on trial for her murder, and there were no eyewitnesses, there was no confession, so it really wasn't a sure thing. The trial was a really big story in Denver, though, as well as nationwide. But cameras were not allowed at this trial. Prosecution laid out their case, which was entirely circumstantial, but quite strong. Big points were that Harold had lied about just about everything, and he stood to gain over $4 million from Tony's life insurance. Yeah, he certainly has stepped up from what he recovered from Lynn. Only a, a paltry 600000 He's working his way up. He yeah. is. The sad thing is that these both seem like super nice families who treated him great, and he probably could have had a great life with either of these women. If he had chosen to. Right, but instead he victimized them. Now, Harold Henthorne's defense attorney said that Harold might be a quirky guy who did lie a lot, but that didn't make him a murderer. That's uh, kind of a pathetic <laughs> argument. <laughs> Isn't that a great defense? He's reaching at the bottom of the barrel there. The prosecution used photos and drone footage to show the hike that Harold and Tony took the day she had died. And they also had cell phone records showing that Harold had scoped out the area nine times in the six months before. I mean, I can't say enough that this was not your normal walk that a couple's going to take or hike that a couple's going to take. No, this, this not is at all. really, really, really rough terrain. Yes. The 911 call was played for the jury. Also, there was evidence that Harold had not really done any CPR. Like we said, her lipstick was still there, and she probably had already passed away by the time he got to her. Yeah, and Barry Bertolette, Tony's brother, who's the cardiologist, testified about the vital signs that Harold had texted him, saying they just don't make any sense. And then there was also the map where Harold had drawn an X at the spot where Tony fell to her death. Now, there's a longtime friend of Harold and Tony's named Daniel Jarvis, and he testified that Harold had told him at Tony's funeral that the map had been made for him. Now, he didn't have any reason to believe that the map had been made for him. There's no reason for that. No, and he's a guy who really believed in Harold at the onset. But then when he was at the funeral, instead of saying anything about Tony or seeking any kind of comfort, he went right over to Daniel and started talking about this map like that was his big concern. So it's almost his behavior after her death as much as his behavior before her death that makes him look so guilty. No, no kidding. And the, the prosecution also presented evidence that Harold may have stolen a diamond from Tony's engagement ring. Right, her hand hadn't been injured and the ring was on her finger, but the diamond was gone. Yeah, and this is a $30,000 diamond. And they had combed thoroughly through the site where Tony had fallen. And then magically, eight months later, the diamond had reappeared in that area, just kind of sitting out there. Yeah, and this goes back to Harold had gotten a lot of pressure about the diamond during the investigation. So investigators believe he went and put that diamond back in some kind of pathetic attempt to squelch that whole suspicion. But of course, it was too late and it was poorly done. Well, it was just sitting out there. They, yeah. They, they would have found it yes. eight, eight months prior. That almost made it worse than if he never returned it. It, it probably did. And then they, they presented the circumstances of Harold's first wife, Lynn. Her death was presented. Then the circumstances of Harold's first wife, Lynn, her death was presented at trial. So there seemed to be many similarities between the two deaths, which was to show a pattern of behavior. Then after the prosecution rested, the defense called no witnesses. Harold didn't take the stand. Probably the smart thing to do. Oh, sure. He would have dug himself a bigger hole. But after 10 hours of deliberation, the jury did find Harold guilty of first-degree murder. And the families of Tony and Lynn were quite close. They were together at the courthouse offering each other support. 
like I said, they just seem like a couple of really nice families. They do. Now, there's one funny, maybe not funny, maybe strange, thing that haunts Tony's brother, Barry, and that's that he once saved Harold from a heart attack. In 2006, Barry was demonstrating a new CT scanner, and he did Harold just to demonstrate. He found that Harold's coronary arteries in his heart were dangerously blocked. So Harold went into surgery and had bypass surgery. Yeah. Interesting, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you say, well, I shouldn't have done that. I'm sure he wouldn't say that, but it's just really ironic, I guess. I don't know. Is that irony? I would say that's irony. Yeah. Harold spread Lynn and Tony's ashes 17 years apart at the same spot. And Haley, Tony and Harold's daughter, went to live with family friends in Colorado. But Barry Bertolette and his wife Paula have gone to court and they hope to adopt their niece. And I'm not sure if that has come to uh, trial yet. I think they have. I think they've gotten her I now. I think, think she's adopted. That's good. I mean, she should be with family instead of friends. It's kind of silly. Right. And Harold, of course, has been appealing. And his latest one was up to the U.S. Supreme Court in 2018. And that was denied. So his appeals have all been exhausted. And there are two documentaries we watched on this case. The first one is 48 Hours, An Accidental Husband. Also, I really liked the one on American Greed called Mr. Too Good to Be True. Very interesting, both of them. They were. And the book called The Black Widower by Michael Fleeman was very excellent and very informative. It was, and it read well, almost like a novel. So I'll put a link to that in our show notes. I always like to leave a link if okay. there's a good book on the topic. Okay. Today's show has been sponsored by ADT, Real Protection. When it comes to something as important as your family's safety, you deserve real protection from ADT. Real Protection means the nation's number one smart home security provider is there for you when you need them. Real Protection means 18,000 employees safeguarding you. No matter how you define safety, ADT is there. ADT, Real Protection. Visit ADT.com forward slash podcast to learn more about how ADT can design and install a secure smart home just for you. The music for True Crime Brewery was written and produced by Tristan Capel. And I'm going to take a minute here to tell our listeners about our members-only episodes, which we produce exclusively for our Team Tie Grabber members and our Patreon supporters. So this month we covered a members-only episode on a guy named Robert Reldan. Robert Reldan was a serial rapist and murderer, a handsome, personable, charmer kind of guy, a little bit like Ted Bundy, who had a friendly smile and really inspired trust from people. So for about 20 years, he caused a dozen or more unsuspecting women to drop their guard and place themselves in danger with him. He seemed very trustworthy, and he was actually a very violent, awful person. He came from a wealthy family and had a lot of support, and got away with a lot before he was finally put in prison. We do have well over 20 of these episodes on our True Crime Premium podcast show, and this includes episodes on Diane Downs. There's a three- or four-part series on O.J. Simpson. There's the Tina Watson episode, Robert Fisher, and the Clara Harris episode. So if you'd like to give us a little support and get some extra episodes, just go to our website, which is tiegrabber.com, or go to patreon.com forward slash tiegrabber, and join. Our members also get a snifter or a bottle opener mailed to them. So it's a fun thing to do, and we really appreciate it. One other thing, we always appreciate reviews on iTunes or wherever you listen to the show. And I'd like to throw a thank you in here to Paul P. for a true crime book that he mailed us all the way from down under in Australia. The book is called The Pajama Girl Mystery, A True Story of Murder, Obsession, and Lies. So this is the book that I'll be reading by the pool. Ew. Yes, I won't get it wet. I hope not. But I will be reading it in my lounge chair with my margarita or whatever, my Las Cruces mule. That's it. But I do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Whenever anyone sends beer or books, we are happy campers. We certainly are. And th this book looks like an interesting one to read. So I'm looking forward to it. It's, it has a very haunting cover, so I can't wait to get into it. So let's get into feedback. You can have your feedback read by sending us an email to truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com. Or you can even send us some comments on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Or... 
What I really prefer is you can tell us what's on your mind by leaving a voicemail on our Leave a Voicemail tab on the right side of the screen on our website homepage. Any way you do it, we love to hear from you. Okay, so this week we have a couple voicemails. The first one is from Selena with a case suggestion. Okay. Hi, Dick. Hi, Jill. My name is Selena Alston, and I am a fairly new listener who has probably binged almost all of the episodes so far. Um... And I have to say that I absolutely love your format. I love you guys' personality. I love the way you mesh together. I mean, being husband and wife, I guess it helps out a whole lot. But um, I just love the feel of your podcast. I recently started a podcast myself. And um, just listening to you guys gives me the motivation to move forward with mine. I have a case suggestion. It's about a murderer named Michelle Blair. It's M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L-E-B-L-A-I-R. Back in, I believe it was 2005, she was being evicted from her apartment. And when the sheriffs came in to serve her uh, the eviction, they found two of her children, two of her four children, dead in a freezer. And as if that wasn't gruesome enough, what made it, what makes it even worse is she killed one nine months before she killed the other one. And the one that she killed second, she made that one help her put the one that she killed first in the freezer. She actually had um, the kids help her beat the ones that she killed. The other, uh, the other kids, she had them help her beat the ones that she killed. And she claims that she killed them because they were molesting her youngest child. And that was never founded. Um, through investigations, the kid, the one that she says was molested said, you know, they never got any testimony from him saying that it happened. And um, her neighbors and everybody, nobody investigated as to why the children weren't going to school, why no one was seeing these kids for the, the length of time that the kids were gone. One of her neighbors, who's a friend of mine on Facebook, um, was telling us the story. And she said that she told them that the two kids were staying with her aunt. But when Christmas came around, she would never see the kids. She would never even buy the kids Christmas gifts. So, you know, I'm always wondering, where was the suspicion? So many people failed those kids because she had issues already with CPS. She went to CPS and asked them what would happen if a parent killed their child or something like that. And, you know, nothing was done. So I think this is a case that you guys could look at or would be interested in. And I hope that you do pick it up. And I look forward to listening to more of your podcasts. Thank you. More of your episodes. Thanks. Bye. Well, thank you so much, Selena. Thank you for all those positive comments. And good luck to you in doing your podcast. We've enjoyed doing ours. It's been fun. It has been. And, and the only advice I would offer Selena is to stick with it. Absolutely. Because... Yeah. Your first ones are going to sound like crap. Well, yeah, and it takes a while to get some listeners and get right. in the groove of things. And you, you got to get your rhythm going and stuff, but keep going. Well, yeah. I mean, we're still working at it. It takes a long time to get anywhere. It's going to continue to be a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Okay, yeah. so what about this horrific case? Well, this is from your hometown of Detroit. Yep, I was born in Detroit. Or the suburbs. And then this is just a real marginalized woman. Who didn't get any help. She the, had the killer? Had four kids and killed the two of them. And then it was three years that they were stuck in the freezer. That's and, awful. And nobody knew. So you're giving some sympathy to the mother who killed the children? Is that what you're saying? Well, she's terribly mentally ill. Oh, okay. I mean, at trial, she said that she has no remorse. Wow. Because she had to protect her youngest child from being raped by the older kids. And the only way to do that was to kill them. The only way to do that was to kill them, in her mind. This sounds like there's so much behind it, Dick. I mean, it sounds like, how was this woman raised? I know. How were these children left to this? It's super heartbreaking. I think it's something we should look into. Yeah, but it's it's going to hurt my heart. It's a tough one. First of all, we need to get some more information, right? Yeah, because if, if there's anything positive that can come out of it, sure. But it really sounds like, like Selena said, these kids were just let down by everyone. They were. And we by, should all feel bad about this. I mean, the teachers at school, I mean, these kids hadn't been at school for who knows how long. 
besides the three years that they were in the freezer. These people lived in poverty, I'm assuming. Worse than poverty, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so they marginalized community. Yeah. Okay. That's a good suggestion. Okay. Now we have another voicemail from Tiffany from your favorite country, Australia. <laughs> well, the United States might be my favorite country. All right. Let's hear what Tiffany has to say. Hey, Jill and Dick. This is Tiffany from Australia. I am such a big fan of yours. I so look forward to Tuesday evenings when I can snuggle up in bed with a cup of tea and I make it my Tuesday night ritual to listen to what's happening at True Crime Brewery. I do have an idea for an episode or um, one of your case studies. It's about uh, a woman in Australia who was actually a German national and her name was Christina Rau, that's spelled R-A-U. And she actually, <laughs> there's a couple of twists to this story. First of all, she ended up at a detention center with amnesia and she was held in detention for, I think, nearly a year because no one knew what her identity was. Um, but the beginning part of the story was that um, she had actually been traumatized by um, going to a cult convention. The cult was a cult in Australia called Kenja. I think it's still going. And um, the leader of the cult ended up committing suicide. So there's lots of twists and turns to this. Uh, Christina Rao ended up committing suicide um, because of the mental issues that she had from being part of a cult. So I know that Scientology is really in the news at the moment over there in the states. Uh, not so much here, but um, it's a very interesting. It's a very interesting story. Scientology and the leader of this cult was actually a disciple of the Scientology movement. So anyway, lots of twists and turns. Very intriguing. There's quite a lot. I just googled it. There's quite a lot of information on Christina Rao, and there's quite a lot of information on the cult of Kenja. Anyway, uh, maybe you could look into it. Interesting reading anyway. Hope you have a wonderful time over there. Now it's coming into spring. We're just going into winter. Um, so enjoy spring in New Mexico and all the best from Australia. Bye. Thank you, Tiffany. I do love the accent. Now, actually, when I started looking for some information on this, it was a bear. I know Tiffany said that there's all sorts of stuff on Google. Yeah. I couldn't find much. But what okay. I did finally stumble on was that Christina Rao is the sister of the person that Tiffany's talking about, the actual person who had amnesia from whether it's the trauma of the cult or what, and had been held for almost years, 10 months, is Cornelia Rao. They're sisters. Okay. And Christina went to bat for her sister Cornelia in terms of her treatment at the hands of the Australian officials. And I'm just sort of scratching the surface so far of looking into this, but it, it's absolutely fascinating. So I'm going to delve some more, and we'll see what we can get. Oh, there is something really fascinating about cults. I know you like cults. I don't like them. I find them right. interesting topics. Right. Right. Yeah, so, okay, let's look into that some more. We will do that. And thanks again, Tiffany. That was a really nice voicemail. And then we have the emails. I know you say, oh, please send me a voicemail. I don't love <laughs> emails. <laughs> I'm practicing my Eeyore voice. Okay. But we love any communication, whether it's voicemail or email. We do. I just love to hear from people because then they're more like real people. You know what I mean? I do. Yeah. But anyway, I got a couple emails. One's from Natalie. So Natalie writes, Dear Jill and Dick, my week begins on Tuesday because that's when I know I'll have a new episode to enjoy. I've been re-listening to some of your older cases and loving it. Well, thank you so much, Natalie. That's super nice. A month ago, I was searching YouTube for some fun and creepy paranormal TV shows to watch when I came upon a documentary by the Oregonian called Ghosts of Highway 20. Thinking it was about some sort of haunted road, I clicked on it. I was surprised to learn that it centered on the many cases of rapes, murders, and disappearances that took place on this stretch of road from the 1970s to the 1990s, many of which have been linked to one man, John Arthur Aykroyd, an Oregon Department of Transportation employee. His believed first victim opens up the story as the only known survivor, 
It's a five-part series which I've included a YouTube link to where you can watch it in full. His list of other known and likely victims even include the rape and disappearance of his 13-year-old stepdaughter. I think this would make a great episode for the brewery, since there is obviously lots of interest and info to be found. Also, while there is some measure of justice, in the end it wasn't very much, and we see this in the family interviews throughout. I kind of skimmed through. I need to sit down with you and watch the series in succession so we can get a feel for it. Okay. But it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, this is like a 20-year span of time that all this stuff was happening. That's amazing. It is, absolutely. So all right. I thought you'd like that one. I will definitely watch that. And then we have an email from Stacy with a case suggestion. Actually, she had more cases. I've uh, edited her email, and uh, I'll save it so we might have some other things from Stacy. All right, so you've separated the cases. I did. We're so just going to do one today. One today is that Stacy would love to hear us do a podcast on Christopher Porto's axe murder of his father and the attempted axe murder of his mother. Thank you, Stacy. So Christopher Porco, what do we know about him? Well, this is interesting. He's a guy convicted of second-degree murder in the death of his father, Peter Porco, and second-degree attempted murder in the wounding and disfigurement of his mom, Joan Porco. Now, Joan, mom, maintains her son's innocence. Now, was he a child when he did this, or an adult? He was an adult. He was in college. And police got to the house, forget how they got notified, but they went to the house and found the father dead and the mother severely wounded. And the responding officer questioning the mother, I guess she was stable enough that they could do that, and it was by eye movements, you know, or move your eyes up and down for yes and sideways for no or something like that. I think I saw this on a true crime show. The mom is disfigured. And she fingers her son, Christopher as the perpetrator. Yeah, and then she changes her mind. And then she changes her mind. Once she recovers and she's fine, she says, I never said that stuff. So you wonder, did she really forget or is she just standing up for her son? Right. Well, remember though, he killed her husband. Right, but you know. And this is a kid who was having troubles in school. He'd been expelled or let go from uh, University of Rochester, I think it was, in New York. Kind of a Bart Whitaker type situation. Yeah. Yeah. And he had forged his father's name on some bank loans to attend school and to purchase a car. And dad found out about it, so he was mightily pissed off. This is a great suggestion. I think this would be great for our show. Okay, so we'll look more into that. Okay, thank you, Stacy. It just seems like a really good TCB episode. It's the kind of thing that I like to cover. Sounds like you. Yes. Okay. Okay, well, thank you so much for your feedback and for listening today. We appreciate it so much. That we do. And we'll see you next time at The Quiet End. Bye-bye. Bye.